Hello, Catherine Shagnam is a fellow at the Bayan Center for Studies who joins us now to shed some more light upon Hajj and in particular what Iran's leader has said. To begin with, Iran's leader used this occasion send out, to send out some messages, one of them being uh, that uh, the U.S. plots to pit Muslims against each other. This is not a new thing, but then do you think that Muslims are aware of this? I don't. Um, I mean, I think that they are a bit more aware of the reality of sectarianism, especially after what happened in Syria and Iraq in particular. Um, but I don't think that they actually comprehend that it matters to them and that it concerns them and that it's up to them to actually change those dynamics. A lot of the time, it very much feels like you know things are happening to the Islamic world um, that is outside the Islamic world's uh, power to change, but that's not true. Um, as Ayatollah Khamenei you know, justly said, it's up to us to decide to actually refuse sectarianism and to abide um, by the rules of unity. And I think that you know today being the, the day of Arafat, it actually matters more than ever because this is the day, as you mentioned, in your report, um, that all sins are forgiven and that people are giving a chance to start anew. Uh, and I think that after what happened, um, you know, the past few years in terms of, you know, the, the, the many deaths, um, the war crimes that were committed against uh, religious communities, various religious communities in the name of hatred um, and, you know, and, and refusal to um, accept people for who they are uh, and agree that they have the right to believe in whatever they want, religious freedom. I think it's important that we remember that unity is actually an Islamic duty, that in Islam, you know, in, compul in religion, there shall be no compulsion, and that we cannot force people to believe um, something that they don't want um, to believe in, and that it's, uh, it's their prerogative to stand free, and that we don't have the right to actually enslave them. And I think that in particular, you know, this year, given what Saudi Arabia has done to the Islamic world, um, in the light of what has happened to pilgrims over the years, you know, the, the oppression, the repression that they continue to face, the fact, for example, that this year Saudi Arabia felt necessary to rule al-Baqi and prevent pilgrims to even, you know, gaze at the cemetery, I, I do believe that this call of, um, for unity is, is more than just necessary. It's almost a religious duty at this point uh, because we cannot continue to stand you know, for the holy sites of Islam to remain under occupation. And I think this is the, where, you know, people need to realize that to stand up for the truth and actually refuse oppression um, is to call for unity, for Islamic unity and beyond, uh, for all people to actually stand free in their faith. And that we have a duty to defend our faith and our truth in the face of oppression. And today, I'm sorry to say, but Saudi Arabia is an oppressor. Saudi Arabia has claimed ownership over not just Mecca, but Medina and other holy sites across the world. Um, and we cannot stand for it. If we are really talking about unity, really talking about religious freedom, we have to speak up. But again, we have to do so in unity and not use others, other minorities, you know, to be gu the guilty parties. What we have to do is take responsibility for ourselves um, and say no to the oppressor. And in this case, they're still sitting in Saudi Arabia claiming ownership and custodianship over that, that do not belong to them. Islam. Well, uh, there's a camp that says, you know, this new young prince, you know, he is a reformist, he is out to change things, and on the surface it seems like maybe he's done some things in that direction, but then when you take a look at some of the recent events, some are saying, you know, that was just window dressing. Absolutely. I mean, if you consider that, you know, he granted women the right to drive, I don't think that he should be applauded for giving women, you know, their very basic human rights. Um, but he went, you know, one step forward, ten step backwards, because only just last week, I believe, or earlier this month, many women activists were actually jailed, you know, for speaking up. Um, you know, for the many human rights abuses that are committed in the kingdom. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, people in, in, in Qatif, for example, in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, because they are Shia Muslim, continue to this day to be persecuted, continue to face abject oppression, and the world remains silent. So we have to understand that, yes, absolutely, unity is paramount for the Islamic world. It is a religious duty, but we also have a duty to speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for those who continue to be oppressed and, and not stand, you know, for the, the, the regime that al Saud continues to, um, you know, to, to, to push forward. And, you know, Mohammed bin Salman is no better uh, than his predecessor, as far as I'm concerned, because he continues to abide by the same rule, which is the rule of the sword. Um, and he's just, you know, pretending to show a kind of face to the West so that the international community would not feel, you know, um, you know too, I would say, disgusted by the real policy that he's running at home, you know, under a convenient media blackout. We have to understand that people still, you know, are beheaded 
in Saudi Arabia. And then after being beheaded, they are still crucified. Uh, you know, if the king wishes to, um, you know, to have it so. We cannot stand for something like this. This is not the real face of Islam, and this is something that, you know, we do not recognize to be Islamic. Thank you very much for that. We appreciate it, Catherine Shagdam, fellow at the Bayan Center for Studies from London. Thank you.